closer. And the closest people get first dibs at Q&A. So come a little closer if you, if you feel like it. Um, all right, so my name's Jess Mears. I'm the deputy campaign manager, and I also have another hat because if you are a Libertarian Party activist, raise your hands. I would like to see my, my family out there. Okay, all these people know how this life goes. You never just have one job, you have a whole bunch. So I work for the National Libertarian Party and I'm also working for the campaign. What I'm doing out here on the road with our candidates is I have a request for, for you. How many of you have one of these cards? It's a hint, hint. Anybody know what it is? Well, it is a lifetime membership card. Yes, that's right. But if you don't know what a lifetime membership is, then what else is this? Membership. Yes, I am a member of the National Libertarian Party. I joined back in 2008. A gentleman who was the state chair of the party at the time told me, Jess, you have to join the party. And I said, I don't want to do that. I would rather spend my money at Chipotle. I'm a broke college student. But he guilted me into it. I decided to put $25 in to become a, night, a member of the National Libertarian Party. And I don't regret those five Chipotle visits that I ha couldn't have. And due to inflation, now it's probably only three or four. So I'm asking you today to spare three or four Chipotle visits and join the National Libertarian Party. If you're not already a member, that somebody should have brought around a form for you to fill out as well as an ill-fitting envelope. I'm sorry, we tried our best. So um, you can fill out this form and donate a gift of $25 to the National Libertarian Party and sign the non-aggression principle. The non-aggression principle says that you certify that you oppose the initiation of force to achieve political or social goals. How's that sound, everyone? Oh, I must be speaking to a crowd of libertarians. <laughs> Surprise, all right. So if you're not already a member, please do just consider joining us as a member. I have some reasons why you should consider joining us as a member. Who knows what it takes to run a political party? Shout it out. Money. Money, and why do we need money? Drugs. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. All right, we need money because we need to elect libertarians. And if you don't think already that we need to elect more libertarians, we have some speakers tonight that I know are going to convince you. So we have Kara Scholes, a city councilor here in this very city that we're standing in. We have, I know, she's, a, she's awesome. Um, so you'll be hearing from her. You'll be hearing from Mr. Cohen. You're going to be hearing from real libertarians that have ran for office, are currently elected for office, are curr currently running for office. And so I would like for you to support them. When you join the national party, your state party, your local party, you're supporting our work to elect candidates. That's all we do. All we do is try to get people elected to office, and it does require resources. We operate on about a $1.5 million a year budget on average. That's not a lot of resources, but with every one of you joining, and I'm not only making this pitch in Minnesota, I'm going around, we are visiting, let's see, I think 47 states this year. Um, considering that it is a pandemic, I'm really proud of the fact that we are coming out to 47 states. I went to Alaska and I'm um, trying my best to get the campaign to agree to go to Hawaii um, to get us to 48. Um, so I'm really proud of the fact that we're holding safe events, we're meeting voters in the public, and our candidates are still traveling. So I'm really, really excited to be able to share with libertarians and non-libertarians all across the country why we need you as part of our movement. That's the whole whole strategy behind this campaign is to grow the movement, to feature people like Kara and other candidates at these events so you can hear from the people that are going to be on your ballot, not only at the very, very top, but also at the very, very bottom. So um, please do consider joining us as a national party member. Um, and the when we I asked you why do we need resources? Why do, am I asking you for a gift of twenty five dollars? We do need your financial comp your financial contribution to do the work that we need to do. So how many states are the Jorgensen Cohen campaign? How many states are we going to be on the ballot this year? 
Oh, they've got you guys well trained yeah. in Minnesota. We are going to be 50 state plus DC. Yeah. Every single American is going to have the opportunity to vote for Dr. Jorgensen and Spike Cohen. Yeah. And we decided that that wasn't enough. We even went for Guam this year. So yeah. voters in Guam, shout out to them. And then not only are we um, on all ballots in all 50 states plus DC and Guam, we are also making some history this year. Dr. Jorgensen is the first woman to ever appear twice in a lifetime on all 50 state plus DC ballots. So I thank you all for being part of history, being here today, and give yourselves a round of applause for coming out to hear a candidate that's gonna be on your ballot. Thank you. Thank you for being part of the process. Thank you for coming to meet the person that you're going to be voting for. It's a rare and special treat, and I'm delighted to have Mr. Cohen here. So please consider when you are leaving today, dropping off a filled out one of these forms at one of these tables here. Our volunteers, where are they? Wave volunteers. These are some wonderful people that have been here for a few hours already. Thanks to the volunteers. Can everyone give them a round of applause? Please join us. We're going to be running candidates next year, the following year, the following year. The Libertarian Party is not going away. No matter how much the establishment wants us to, we will not be silenced and we need you with us. So thank you, everyone. And if you have any questions, find me. I'm here. I'm here for you. So thank you, everybody. I, I, I got a few notes. I know people don't like me using note cards, Matt, but I'm going to. Um, I wrote a few notes down. So the masks, the social distancing, please. You know, Karen went through a lot of work to get us these permits, so we don't want to get fined from the state, even though we're libertarian, so F the state. <laughs> but uh, thanks, yeah, that's right. They're the problem. We're the solution. We don't want to be arrested like the, the woman at the football game in Ohio or the people at Outdoor Church in Idaho. Um, but I think that shows the mindset of, of people complying without challenging authority. And that's what we do. We challenge authority. You do, these people do, and that's the only way society is going to evolve. I do want to take a few minutes before I introduce our speakers um, to talk about 2020 is a painful year. It's a year of death. I think we all realize that. We've all lost friends. We've lost loved ones. I have. I uh, lost my nephew yesterday. He's six years old. I'll be leaving on Sunday to go to his funeral in Milwaukee. So uh, I was a little struggling to get here today and keep myself together. We obviously lost uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg this, this last week. Uh, no matter your opinion, she was a great public servant and a legend and really helped. Uh, deliver a lot of uh, women's rights, uh, judicial policies. We also lost, was it yesterday or the day before, I think it was yesterday, Adam Weeks. He was a local candidate, a friend of many of us. He was running for U.S. Congress in Minnesota District 2 for the Legal Marijuana Now Party. And anyone who runs for office, especially as a third party candidate, really deserves a lot of respect because it's an uphill battle they obviously stack the deck against us as candidates, as a party, and we fight and we overcome and we present options. So condolences to Adam Weeks. Uh, the last death I want to mention, uh, September 10th, the founder of the Libertarian Party of Minnesota and the first chair, Ed Kontoski, died. And he had contacted me previously to his passing to offer his book, inventory to us. I'm working on securing that and then we will give them out for memberships or, or something like that. But you know he 
uh, was a very passionate, principled person. He didn't do a lot in the public eye in libertarianism after the 70s. He focused on being an author, but he was a real champion of liberty and, and the reason that this party got started in this state. So, uh, Outside of people dying, and we're also seeing the death of our cities right now with poor leadership, both locally with progressive liberal Democrat politicians and nationally with Republican police state politicians. We're seeing the death of justice right now. We have a lot of issues with police brutality, which is one of the nearest and dearest issues to my heart. And the fact that there's not equal justice under law for all people is a travesty. And that's one of my driving forces and one of the driving forces of this party. We're seeing the death of our liberty. Thanks. We're seeing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Before we see any further destruction and death of our liberty and our rights, how about we see the death and destruction of the duopoly? It's time for the Republican Party and the Democrat Party to die. And the only one who can kill them is the Libertarian Party. We are the only party who advocates for smaller government. We're the only ad a party who wants to end qualified immunity, end the drug war, no not grades, mandatory minimums, civil asset forfeiture, foreign war. We're the only party proposing any of those solutions. As Jess said, we're the only party, third party on the ballot in all 50 states. Yeah, that's a great accomplishment. That takes a lot of work. Currently, there was a poll out by Marist showing Joe Jorgensen at 5%. There was a poll, that's, and that's an achievement. And I tell everyone that if we get 5% in Minnesota, we become a major party. That is a huge victory. Currently in Minnesota, we're polling at 4% by Trafalgar. So we are very close to expounding upon our last threshold achieved in 2016, which was almost 4%. And that is due in large part to the woman I'm going to introduce who's going to be our first speaker. Kara Schultz. Yeah, I'm just, Kara Schultz, everyone, if you don't know her, uh, I'd be shocked. She is a legend in this party. She's, she's a leader to all of us. She's taught me a great many things. She's, as, I've been in this party seven or eight years. I've known Kara from day one, where she told me if I didn't run for governor, she was gonna run her cat. <laughs> she went on to be the state chair of the presidential campaign for Gary Johnson in both 2012, where we got around 1%, and in 2016, where we got around 4%. That was all run by this woman right here. She was elected to the Burnsville City Council in 2016, where she currently serves. She's running for re-election this year. She's a national LP recruiter and candidate specialist and trainer. She's also an author. She has some fantastic writings, a book called Martinis and Marshmallows. I favor the martini part myself but she also has a podcast stream called sweet subversives and before i pass it over uh just a, a couple quick personal notes uh, when i did run for governor in 2014 for this party kara really taught me how to keep my shit together <clears throat> she taught me to accept haters and trolls as a badge of honor that that means you're being heard. That means people are threatened. You should all take that lesson to heart also. In 2016, she joined me at several protests when Philando Castile was killed at the governor's mansion. And she brought refreshments, like that table over there. She would make baked goods. She'd bring pop. And we would hand it out to protesters and take care of them. That's Kara Schultz right there. She cares about people more than politics. In, in 2018, 
she helped get Vince Workman elected to Burnsville City Council, another libertarian. And this year, my, my dog died uh, in March, which was heartbreaking to me. The first person to show up at my door with a bowl of homemade soup was Kara Schultz. So I love this woman. I couldn't be more privileged and more honored to call her a friend, an inspiration, and a, a libertarian hero. I'm going to turn it over to Kara Schultz. He's such a jerk. He's trying to make me cry before I have to talk. <laughs> First of all, I wanted to thank you all for coming and welcome you to Burnsville. This is truly a beautiful city and I'm happy that you're able to be here today. As Chris said, I do have the honor of serving on the Burnsville City Council and I am one of those rarest of animals, a libertarian that's going to be reelected. So how this came about was in 2013, Gary Johnson and Judge Jim Gray uh, traveled to some states and talked to people and pulled a few of us aside here in Minnesota. And they did this in other, other um, states as well. And they asked us to run for office, specifically to run for local office, because local office is where you can most directly impact people's daily lives. Now I had not ever considered running for office. But then again, no one had ever asked me. So I did think about it, um, discussed it with my long-suffering husband, and then I threw my hat into the ring for city council. So I put my heart and soul into that 2014 race. Every moment was devoted to knocking doors and campaigning, and that was from June until election day in November. And then election night finally happened and I lost and I was crushed and I laid awake at night for weeks thinking about what I could have done differently what I should have done more of what I shouldn't have done and that was really hard but I took all the lessons that I learned and I wrote them down and I planned to run again in 2016 and I had everything ready to go and then I was diagnosed with advanced colon cancer and let me tell you, that was harder. But I am not someone that gives up easily. So I did file to run for city council. And I did take everything I learned in 2014, and I threw myself into that campaign. I was recovering from multiple surgeries. I was undergoing chemotherapy. But I was going to knock every door. I threw up from one end of this town to another. I did faint in someone's yard. My feet bled. But I kept at it and I did knock every door. Because this is important. It is important to give voters a liberty option on their ballot. It is important to, prevent, to present solutions to the very real challenges that our residents face that do not involve violence, force, or fraud. And it is very important to get the message out that if what you are doing isn't harming anyone else. The government shouldn't take your money to monitor you and then prevent your activities. And that is a message that resonated with voters. And this time I won. So now I'm going to ask you, run for office. Campaigning will be hard. You're going to miss family dinners, fun times with friends, and vacations. Run anyway. It's going to be physically grueling. You're going to work all day, and then every evening for four hours, you're going to knock on doors. Weeks are going to turn into months. Your body will hurt. You will be exhausted. You will get sick. Run anyway. It's emotionally trying. You will swing from hope to despair several times a day. You will feel alone. People will attack you and say 
truly vile things about you. Run anyway, because when you get elected, you can have a profound and lasting impact in your community. In my four years, I have stripped out over regulation, I have protected civil rights, and I have never voted to increase taxes. I have blocked government from closing down a church who did not have a permit and who opened their doors in the depths of winter to people who are homeless. Just this week, I was able to push through additional funding, additional help for businesses that were on the verge of closing due to excessive and never ending executive orders. Now this help, this grant, was in the form of funds taken by our federal government, but they were taken from these very businesses. And unlike other city governments all around us who kept 90% of this stolen money for themselves, Burnsville is giving back these stolen funds to the people that it was stolen from. You know, it used to be that government broke your legs and then gave you a crutch. Now they don't even want to give you the crutch. And that's why we need more libertarians in local office, demonstrating what it looks like when libertarians govern. For example, Rich Manzo, he was elected to the Jefftown's, Jefftown, New Hampshire budget committee, a budget committee, right? But in just two years, he was able to reduce the town budget and he saved residents millions of dollars. Another libertarian was elected as a library trustee in Berlin, Massachusetts. And you're like, really? Library trustee? What can a library trustee do? Well, he was calm and he was trustworthy and he showed them that good ideas don't require force. And that libertarians are great community-minded people to work with. And because of his example, because his residents now trust him and understand what a libertarian is, that city now brings in more votes for libertarian presidential candidates than anywhere in that state. I suspect you're going to like this next example. Cassandra Fryman was elected mayor in Plymouth, Ohio in 2019. Not only did she bring transparency to local government by personally live streaming the meetings over objections, she decriminalized marijuana in her very first year in office. So yeah, running for office is hard. And also, yes, local office is where you will most directly impact people's daily lives. And so I am asking you, as it was asked of me, run anyway. I was busy uh, taking selfies over there. I missed the. Uh, that was great. Thank you so much, Kara, for everything you've done. And you people in Burnsville are lucky to have her. We in the Libertarian Party are lucky to have her. Woo! The next Burnsville individual I'm going to introduce is. Also here because of Kara Schultz, I think, I don't know, maybe not, but she, she, she uh, persuaded him to get more involved. He answered the call that Kara just made to everyone, and his name is Chris Claviter. He's running, well, I'm not done with you yet, mister, you wait. Uh, he's running for mayor of Burnsville. Now, um, Mr. Claviter here was actually born in Korea to an American GI and a Korean woman, and I believe his parents are here. So thank you for thank you for what you made. <laughs> uh, he was raised in Rochester, Minnesota. He spent four years in the army, then six years in the Minnesota Air National Guard. He's been 
a firefighter in my city of St. Paul for 15 years. There were some amazing photographs of him putting out a 60-foot blaze in downtown St. Paul roughly six weeks ago. I couldn't believe that was my friend Chris Claviter putting out fires in my city. He also is a judge for mixed martial arts. A ref, I'm sorry, an official. I don't know the technical term, but um, first time I met him, I thought he was going to kick my ass. I still think he might kick my ass you know, every time I see him. And my uh, personal story about Chris is uh, when I ran for city council in St. Paul in 2019, Yes, I'm a glutton for punishment, I know. But, but I did get 13%, you know, when I ran for mayor, I only got one. So, you know, baby steps. But this guy came and helped me knock on doors and hand out literature in the deepest blue of deep blue cities of St. Paul to deliver libertarian messages. And he had more energy, charisma, and just go-getter attitude than anyone who has come out and that I've met for the first time. I, I was just thrilled to have him help me and that's why I am here to help him. I would like you to all help him. He believes in servant leadership, serving the people, and he will be a fantastic next mayor of Burnsville. Chris Claviter. Thank you, everyone. <clears throat> Thank you to Chris Holbrook. Thank you to Kara Schultz. Many of us would not be here if it wasn't for her. <clears throat> and thank you to Spike Cohen and Joe Jorgensen for giving us this time. <clears throat> and thank you, thank you all of you who have shown up for this event and many other events to help each and every one of us restore power in this country. And I can tell you, we are tired. We are tired of being ignored. We are tired of being told that we do not have a, a voice. We are tired of being told to hold our nose and accept that this, that this stuff stinks. We are tired of empowering those who instill fear in all of us. We are tired of being asked to spy on our neighbors and we are tired of being asked to look the other way while our constitutional rights are stripped down in front of us. We are tired of being told it is not our time while the sins of the past continue to oppress our friends and our neighbors. We are tired of multinational corporations and banks receiving bailouts funded by all of us while our neighbors are forced to once and for all shut the doors on their life's work and the entirety of their dreams. We are tired of politicians that appoint pay raises for themselves while asking each of us to reach deeper into our own pockets. We are tired of the oligarchy that refuses to listen to dissent, they refuse to hear our criticisms, and when our criticisms become demands, they attack us. They attack us for demanding an end to oppression. And we are tired of it. I've met a lot of you today, and I see a lot more faces now. Great turnout. But as I look around at all of you today, I can see that I am not the only one who is tired. However, to our detractors in the crowd, to those who came to spy on us and listen to us, be warned. Our exhaustion is not a sign of we are weakening. Make no misinterpretations. Our exhaustion is the spark that will ignite the passion in each and every one of you to rise up. Together, as a nation, the large majority of us, a greater majority than turns out for the votes, agreed that we want mental health care first responders. And what did politicians do? They gave us roundabout safe answers when none of us felt safe. We made a demand as a people, and they used it to divide us once again. They use the disenfranchised radicals on the far right and the far left as representatives of all of us so they could stoke the flames of violence once more. 
They did this for the same reason they sent us to war just a few short years ago. It was always about staying in power. It is time to hold those who divide us accountable once and for all. Our ignition will not be violent. We are peaceful people. We are the party of the non-aggression principle and we will not have a call to arms. What we will have, what we have starting here, now before us is a call to action. This is why I'm running for mayor of this city. This is why I ask of each and every one of you, this is why Kara asked each and every one of you to find a spot on the ballot and run for office. The time, voting is simply not enough. The co time has come to challenge the authority for their positions. It is time to take the reins of power from a tradition of abuse and corruption. Please, promise me today that you will take an oath to work together, to challenge each other and to grow together so that we can rise up and begin a new chapter in an American dream. A chapter which begins with a fight for true equality across all of America. I believe, I know this will happen because we may be tired, but we welcome hard work. Every single libertarian I know wants to work. We are just tired of half of our efforts, half of our pay being used to support the ruling class that weighs down on us. It's time to rise up and outwork them and, and keep doing this until we have it all established a spot at the table in the farmhouse. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Chris Claviter. I'm running for mayor of Burnsville. Let's go Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen in 2020. I got my own microphone. That's great. We're gonna hug and do other stuff later. I'm just trying to do the elbow bump to be you know, socially proper. <laughs> I was going to say some uh, outrageous things, but I mean, they just naturally come out, so I'm not going to try to. They're, they just happen. Um, I'm going to take a little extra time here before I, I introduce our, our keynote, uh, because, again, I want to thank all of the volunteers here. Pl please, another round of applause for the Libertarians who are manning booths if you need refreshment. You can sign up and buy merch. There are yard signs I believe for free today for anyone who wants one so make sure you get them I want to thank Matt Kowalski our executive director here who's filming he doesn't get enough applause this guy right here he works his ass off for all of us and uh, I'm gonna tell a quick story about Joe Jorgensen unfortunately she came down ill last night we were informed about 10 p.m. she what was not going to make this trip based on uh, health advice, but uh, thank God Spike is. But what I was going to talk about Joe Jorgensen, obviously there, there were some points mentioned earlier and Spike will mention uh, the campaign's points, but what a lot of people don't know is she came here in June, on June 19th, Juneteenth. It wasn't a publicized event, we didn't do a big media junket. There was very little video or meetings. She wanted me to take her to the George Floyd Memorial. She wanted me to show her the destruction on Lake Street in Minneapolis, on University Avenue in St. Paul. She wanted to go to North Minneapolis to a ethnic festival, which, which we went to, and she was able to speak to some local community leaders. And one thing I love, about libertarians, and you see it with Chris, you see it with Spike, you see it with Kara, you see it with Joe. They put the people first. They want to get to know the people. The individual comes before the state. They put a lot of effort into finding out what that means. And when I was with Joe on uh, Lake Street, there was tons of broken glass and timbers, and she was walking around barefoot. And I thought, oh shit, I'm gonna get in a lot of trouble when her foot bleeds open, 
and she's like, no, I'm good. I, you know, I'm, I have tough feet and stuff. So I was going to tell a story about, you know, walking over broken glass for the people, but uh, she's not here to enjoy that joke. Anyways, so Spike here, uh, Jeremy, Spike Cohen, I believe we met 10 days ago. He was in town. He came to town to support Chris Claviter for a rally. We had an event at um, Watering Hole afterwards. But I, for the first time, met him and learned a great deal about him and his intelligence and his passion and his compassion. This guy was born in Baltimore, Maryland. At the age of three, this is from his Wikipedia page. At the age of three, he declared that his nickname would forever be Spike due to the 1986 film, My Little Pony. <laughs> he became a young tech entrepreneur, um, and I asked him if I could mention this. In 2016, uh, he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, which led him to the selling of his web development business so he could focus on what mattered most to him, which was libertarian activism. He currently has a podcast called Muddled Waters. Muddied Waters. Muddied Waters. I'm sorry, I'm not a podcast specialist, but uh, Muddied Waters Media. He was married in 2010 to Tasha, and I met her at this establishment. And you know, but before I turn this over, and he talks about our, the principles of self-sovereignty and non-aggression and voluntary solutions and property rights, uh, which we are all, all support, obviously. It was, it was amazing, and I hope this isn't offensive, but when his wife walked in that bar, I thought, wow, that woman is smoking. And my wife's not here, so, you know, she... Um, and I went up and talked to her, of course, and I find out she's married to this guy. I'm like, what? Really? And she just told me this story about the light that comes out of this man when he's talking about liberty principles. And she has rarely seen that light brighter than she's seen it right now, and that's why she fell in love with him. And I think you're all going to fall in love with him too. Jeremy Spike Cohen. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Burnsville, Minnesota. That's right. You, no, it's okay. You can applaud your name. Who here is ready to take the power back? Who here is ready to end the Republican gravy train, not just in D.C., but in every state in the Union? Who here is ready to build a future for our children and their children and their children that is freer and safer and healthier and more prosperous than we have now? Well, folks, that's why Joe Jorgensen and I are running for president and vice president, because we've seen what has happened with the Republicans and Democrats having total control of every lever of power in government for over 160 years. They've used that control to steal your power, to steal your freedom, to steal your ability to make decisions for yourselves and your families and communities, and of course, to steal your money. The reason that Joe and I are running is because we recognize that the best way for us to move forward and to have that prosperity and to have that freedom and to have that happiness is for us to take that power back and take that freedom back and take that money back, and that's why we're running. <laughs> Folks, who here is sick and tired of watching their loved ones, their family members, maybe even yourselves, sign up and swear to protect the Constitution and the American people against all enemies, foreign and domestic, only to be sent overseas by those same domestic enemies to fight and kill and potentially die on behalf of military contractors and central bankers and foreign dictators. And who here is sick and tired of watching those same people that signed up to fight on our behalf, if they're fortunate enough not to come home in a flag-draped casket, being subjected to the worst form of health care in this country, the Veterans Administration? 
Who here is sick and tired of watching the cost of living spiraling out of control and the gap between those who have and those who do not have continuing to worsen and widen because of disastrous economic policies from the Republicans and Democrats? Who here is sick and tired of watching entire industries flee, not just here in Minnesota, but the entire country, and go overseas or just go out of business because government is making it increasingly unaffordable for you to do business in America and hire Americans? Who here is sick and tired of seeing one story after the next or possibly being victim of the next story of an increasingly militarized, an increasingly unaccountable police state brutalizing people. Folks like in this community, like George Floyd and Philando Castile, and watching bad officers who harm us walk away scot-free. And who here is sick and tired of watching that same militarized police state tell you, the American people, what kind of guns you should be allowed to have to protect yourselves and your families and your communities while they go buy any kind of weaponry they want and stick you with the bill for it? I heard you. <laughs> Who here is sick and tired of being told? Oh, I'm not there yet. Who here is sick and tired? I got ahead of myself. Who here is sick and tired of watching entire communities being criminalized and destroyed because of this disastrous failed war on drugs? <laughs> and folks, who here is sick and tired? Now it's time to say it. Who here is sick and tired? of being told whether or not you're essential, whether or not you should be allowed to go outside, whether or not you should be allowed to run your business, whether or not you should be allowed to work and provide for your families, whether or not you should be able to live your lives because of a pandemic that was imposed upon you because they didn't let medical professionals test COVID patients for the first two months that the virus was here. Who is sick of all of these things? Folks, I'm as sick of it as you are. That's why I'm running. I'm not a career politician. I've never run for I've never run for office before. And the reason that I'm running is because I'm sick and tired of seeing these things happen. And the, that's why Joe is running as well, because we recognize that the only way we are going to stop these things is by replacing these people with libertarians, not just voting third party to get a new to get new people in, in office or get some new party in office, but to actual policy changes to end the Fed, to end the IRS, to end the ATF, to end the DEA, to end police brutality, to end qualified immunity and the war on drugs and civil asset forfeiture and mandatory minimum sentencing and no rock knock raids and cash bail and every other terrible Republican policy that they have imposed upon you and robbed you to pay for. That is why we are voting for Joe Jorgensen. And folks, let's be clear. These policies, the outcomes of these policies, these aren't unintended consequences that they had no idea were going to happen. We've been telling them in this party alone, we've been telling them since 1971 that this is what would happen if they did these things. They knew it and they did it anyway because they want you to be scared. They want you to be anxious. They want you to be desperate. They want you not to know whether or not you'll be able to afford to pay your rent or your mortgage. They want you to be horrified at the thought that you'll end up in an emergency room and oh, and, and be financially ruined for years. They want you to be scared. They want you to be desperate. They want you to be hopeless. They want to break your spirit. Because if they can make you hopeless, and if they can break your spirit, then it's that much easier to control you. It's that much easier to tell you that everything will be okay if you just give them the rest of your control, the rest of your money, the rest of your freedom, then you'll be safe, then you'll be healthy, then you won't have anything to worry about, then everything is going to be fine. Well, folks, we know that the sociopaths who put us in this situation are the last people that we should trust to fix the problems that they've created. That's why we're not wasting our vote for the people that created these problems. This election is far too important to vote for the same monsters who created this problem. That's why we're libertarian. That's why we're voting for Joe Jorgensen. Now folks, before I talk about my running mate, let me take a moment to talk 
about the folks who are asking you to waste your vote. Let's talk for a minute about Joe Biden. Oh, you, you, so you've heard of him. Uh, Joe Biden, name a policy you hate. The war on drugs, the militarized police state, police brutality, the endless yep. wars overseas. He has not, he's not only, he's either signed it or sponsored it or written it into law or overseen its enforcement during his eight years in the White House. Joe Biden is the architect of every bad policy to come out of Washington, D.C. in the nearly 50 years he has been there when he's not busy sniffing children or trying to make women kiss him. And how appropriate that one of the architects of the militarized police state would choose as his running mate its most brutal enforcer. Let's talk for a moment about Kamala Harris. Whoa! Uh oh, heard of her too. It's a smart crowd. Kamala Harris, someone who has the distinction of locking away more people for victimless crimes at the state level than any other person alive. Kamala Harris, who at least twice that we know of, intentionally withheld exculpatory evidence in a capital murder case. Let me say that again. She knew that the person she and her office, at least twice, at the person that she and her office were prosecuting for murder did not commit the crime and she continued to try to have them executed and even withheld evidence that demonstrated that they more than likely didn't do it. Why? So that it wouldn't lower her conviction record. These are the folks that the Democrat Party have asked you to throw your vote away for. Now, while we're at it, let's talk about the other wing of that plane crash. Let's talk about Donald Trump. Uh. Hey, stop, stop, stop leading my speech, pal. That's uh, <laughs> uh, Donald Trump, lifelong crony. This is a man who has used the power of government to enrich himself at the expense of everyone else around him. Whether we're talking about using eminent domain to force widows to sell their properties to him when they did not want to sell to him to build his next failed casino project and when that casino project would fail, using the bankruptcy courts to make sure that he unloaded as much of the debt as he could on his poor investors and keep as much of the profit as he could for himself. Donald Trump, a man that said that he would, uh, he said that he would drain the swamp only to become the king of the swamp creatures. He said that he would lower government spending. And instead, yeah, right? Instead, we just found out that this year, the federal government is going to spend $6.6 .6 trillion, nearly twice as much as Barack oh. Obama even spent in any single year. Yay, new record. Donald Trump, a man who said that he would end the entire national debt, and instead he has run up more debt in less than one full term than any president before him, including Barack Obama, who had nearly doubled the debt in two terms. Trump has beaten that record in less than one term. Donald Trump, a man who said that he would end this wars overseas and bring the troops home, and instead there are 15,000 more troops overseas now than there were when he got into office. Donald Trump who said that he would protect our right to keep and bear arms. And he, with help from the NRA, have gone instead to pass more gun control regulations and executive orders than the last five presidents before you. And before I move further, let me talk for a moment about his running mate. Let me talk as much about Mike Pence as he has demonstrated relevance during this administration. I'm sorry, I forgot what I was talking about. I'm so sorry. That never happens, that never happens. Now, that's who the Republicans have asked you to throw your vote away for and to waste your vote. Let's talk for a moment about someone who is not a wasted vote. Let's talk about Dr. Joe Jorgensen. Let's talk about Joe Jorgensen, a brilliant self-made entrepreneur, a woman who we don't have to worry whether or not she's gonna pass a cognitive test because apparently that's a thing now that we have to worry about with other candidates. 
Joe Jorgensen, someone who is ready to lead from day one, not by taking your con taking control of your life or taking more power from you, but just the opposite, giving you your control back. Because Joe and I recognize that the best way that you're going to thrive, the best way your communities are going to grow and prosper, the best way that you're going to live safer and healthier lives is for you to have your power and your wealth and your freedom and your money back where it belonged, always in your hands where it always belonged. Folks, this is why the debate cartel is shutting Joe and I out of these debates, because they know that if you put Joe Jorgensen between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, two men who can barely form a coherent sentence between the two of them, and who are emblematic of every bad policy and action to come out of D.C. in the last several decades, and you put between them someone who will be able to demonstrate how they created these problems and how our common sense libertarian solutions will fix the problems that these sociopaths have created, that the game is over, and that we win. That is why they're shutting us out, and that's why we have to be even louder than them. Folks, Joe and I, the Libertarian Party of Minnesota, folks like Chris and Chris, and there were, Joe, there were only two Chris's, Chris and Chris and Kara and people across this country, we are working to build a army for human liberty, and we need your help. If you haven't done so already, I ask you to join the Libertarian Party. Go to lp.org and sign up today to join the party. It is the Libertarian Party that is the bulwark against the Republicrats and their aims to take even more from you, to make your life even harder than it is now, to make it harder and harder and harder for you and your children and their children. It is the Libertarian Party that wants to do the opposite. Put it back in your hands. Give you your money back. Give you your power back. Let you thrive. Let you live your life and stop making it so hard so that you can grow in ways that they would never allow it. So join the Libertarian Party today. And once you've done that, Go talk to one of these volunteers here, or to Kara, or to uh, Chris, or to Chris, uh, and ask them about joining the state party, joining the Libertarian Party of Minnesota, because that's where it's happening on the grassroots level. It is at the grassroots level that we are influencing our friends, and our neighbors, and our colleagues, and our family members, and loved ones, and telling them the message of liberty, and telling them why we are libertarians, why we believe that maximizing human freedom is the way forward for our communities, and our society, and our country. It is that, it is in the grassroots level where those things happen. So I ask you to join that as well. And once you've done that, I ask you to go to joe20.com and we have a volunteer for the form that we would love to have you fill out. And if you're able to make a contribution either online or today, then I would greatly appreciate it because it is what we need to be able to continue to do bus tours like this. It is what we need to be able to go around the country to visit all or most of the 50 states at a time when our opponents are hiding in their bunkers and their basements from the American people who are out in the streets literally protesting the intended outcomes of their policies. We are here talking to the people in the streets about it and how we can fix it with libertarian ideals. And we need your help to be able to do that. Because folks, unlike the Republicans and Democrats, we aren't gonna rob you to pay for our campaign. You may not know this, but Republicans and Democrats receive something called federal matching funds, which means basically that they rob you with income taxes because all taxation, as we know, is theft. I know how to do an applause line. They rob you to help pay for their campaigns because they don't just think that they're entitled to your vote. They don't just think they're entitled to your support. They think they're entitled to your money to pay for their campaigns. Folks, the Libertarian Party has never taken a penny of matching funds and we never will. Because we believe that if we're going to get your money and your vote and support, it isn't because we forced you into it or scared you into it or coerced you into it or used the IRS to hold a gun to your head and force you to do it. It's because we earned it. We wanna earn your support. We wanna earn your vote and we wanna earn whatever contribution you're able to make. And if we have earned it today, I ask you to give what you can to be able to help us continue to spread the message of liberty, not just here, but around the country. So folks, we're gonna get started with a QA and a here. And we're gonna answer, uh, say four or five questions. And then, uh, and then once we're done here, I'm gonna mill about and get to do some meet and greet with y'all and uh, get to talk with you and uh, take selfies and sign autographs and all sorts of fun stuff. Uh, but before we get started on this, I just wanna close and say this. As I said before, the Libertarian Party, this campaign, everyone here, we are fighting to build 
an army for human liberty, fighting for a world and a country set free in our time. And our time is now. Now, who's with me? Yeah. Sounded like all of you were with me. So uh, if you want to go up to this young man here, uh, we will take the first few questions, and then we will start with the meet and greet. And while we're waiting for folks to come up, one thing I forgot to know, corporate funding. Last time I checked, Donald Trump had received around $100 million in corporate funding, and Joe Biden had received something like $150 million in corporate funding. I am happy to report that as of the last time I checked, the Jorgensen Cohen campaign has received exactly $0.00 and zero cents in corporate funding. For two very powerful reasons. Number one, we'd never accept it. And number two, they'd never give it to us because they know these multinational, multi-trillion dollar crony corporations know that when libertarians get into office and dismantle their systems and put the power and the money back in, in your hands, the gravy train's over. They can't just continue to sap from you and to take trillions of dollars from you and stick you with the bill with interest. They'll have to live within their means and pull themselves up by their bootstraps and that's the last thing they want. And that's why they do everything they can to fight us getting into office and that's why we have to fight back even harder. Hi, how are you doing? Oh, doing well, thank you. Uh, that was a very serious speech, a lot of serious topics. I have a quick, easy one for you. Sure. When the Hollywood movie is inevitably made about the first uh, libertarian president, uh, who do you want to play you? <laughs> as long as that gets correct. God. Um... <laughs> Great question. Um... The first person that comes to mind is Steve Carell, but he's going to be so much older than me. <laughs> but Steve Carell. That's, I'd say that, Steve Carell. Or we'll go the other way, like Will Ferrell, where it doesn't even make sense. But, but, but if not that, then Steve Carell, yeah. Thank you very much. Yes, um, why don't you ever talk about ending government-created monopolies? Like, uh, for example, nonprofit schools, public electric utilities, and these uh, oligopolies of medical practitioners we have out there. I'm not hearing it in the speeches or seeing it on your website. Oh, you should, well, it, I would encourage you to look at my YouTube channel and the Q&As that we've done because it, it gets brought up a lot. You're absolutely 100% correct. The government is protecting these industries. The government is protecting these, uh, uh, the, as you said, the oligarchs, these people that have, have uh, entrenched themselves and protected their market share from any new innovative competitors by creating regulatory burdens that make it nearly impossible or at least uh, prohibitively expensive for them to be able to, to forge ahead and, and do that. That. That's, that is the core part of our messaging, is that the only way that we will be able to have true capitalism, a true market set free, is to dismantle these powers, and it has to happen from the government level. These, uh, these monopolies and these, these oligarchies, these massive corporations uh, that sap from us in our tax dollars and get tax breaks so that they don't have to pay their share and then get stuck with all the, and then get all the subsidies that we just paid for, None of that would exist in a market set free. That is why we need to deregulate. That is why we need a market set free. And that is why the government needs to stop indemnifying major corporations against lawsuits when they do measurable and provable property damage to us. So thank you. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I uh, want to ask a question is how, how are we supposed to get Joe Jorgensen into the polls of the uh, when I answer the phone they never ask for Joe's Joe's name and if they do if they call you and you and they say are you voting for Donald Trump or Joseph Biden and you say I'm voting for Joe Jorgensen and they go uh, that's that name is not on here have a great day one of two things happens they either put you in this other or slash didn't answer uh, which which usually you know you have to go through the cross tabs to even see where that is or uh, they just hang up on you, did not answer. And that happens a lot. We've had a lot of people report back that, you know, they just got hung up on. Well, that's not on the, that's not on the poll. And the short answer is there's not much we can do other than be louder than them. That is why we have to do this at the, at the grassroots level. That's why we have to do our own video ad placement. That's why we have to get our message out there. They are not going to give us a seat at their table because their table is a gravy train. Their table is a federal trough for the massive pigs to show up to take our money that they steal from us. So they're not gonna give us a seat at that table. We have to make our own table and we have to knock theirs over. Yeah. That was a New Testament reference, by the way. <laughs> Hi, how are you doing? I'm doing well, Mr. Cohen, and yourself? I'm doing great. 
I'm actually here on behalf of my father. Okay. He is a truck driver and he wants to know yours and Joe's opinion on the trucking industry and if you truly mean by deregulation, deregulating the trucking industry so that they can make their lives without being told when they can and cannot pee. Absolutely. It is none of the federal... Yeah, applaud that, by the way. Applaud it. And I'm sorry, you may have said your name, but I didn't catch it. Heather. Heather. It is none of the federal government's business what your father or truck drivers are doing. Go read the Constitution when you're done with this and go tell me where it says truck driver, okay? And then when you're done with that, go read the Tenth Amendment, which says very clearly that if the Constitution doesn't explicitly give a power, grant a power in the Constitution to the federal government, it is left to the states or to the people, preferably just to the people. During the time that the federal government has been involved with regulating the trucking industry, the safety has not improved that much. It really has not. In fact, depending on how you measure it, it's actually gotten worse. In terms of property damage, it's gotten worse. You know what also has gotten worse? The average pay for a trucker. Because now they are stuck at what, 10 hours that they can drive? They're told that, even lower? Depending on the state, it can go low as, as low as nine and a half drive time, and then they can have two hours for going through their morning and evening checks as well as being on the docks. Yeah, and so as a result of that nonsense, you often see truckers parked on the shoulder of an interstate because they can't go any further. That's safe, right? You know, for their safety. Just park on this little gravel area while people drive by 70 miles an hour. That's way safer than you driving another 20 minutes to a rest stop. This is what happens when the federal government gets involved. And truckers, their, uh, the amount, their livelihood is plummeted. You have seen uh, truckers that are driving illegally that just show up and go, I'm not getting any of these permits and I'm driving as long as I want so I can charge less, which puts truckers that want to do it the legal way either out of business or forced to take on more and more loads uh, and, and make less and less money. It is none of the federal government's business business, uh, what the uh, what truckers are doing, uh, and if there is to be any role in the Department of Transportation, it should not be in that. That should absolutely, your father should be free to truck as he wants, because frankly, truckers are exponentially safer drivers. They're far better trained, and it's none of the federal government's business in the first place. So yes, we would completely deregulate that to zero. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. My name is Taras. Uh, I first wanted to uh, sort of compliment you on your speech and uh, also compliment the volunteers. Uh, we've had great messaging this year. Like, uh, I think in 2016, I never got any texts about events, but this year my phone's blowing up and I'm loving it. So the question I wanted to ask is, uh, where are we looking for growth opportunities in terms of uh, picking up new voters and supporters and how are we uh, sort of changing our message how are we changing our messaging to uh, appeal to you know urban voters or uh, folks out in the country things like that so and that's a great you said your name is ross taras Tar okay. taras okay taras yeah. thank you thank you ross uh, is fine. No, no, but that, no, I, your name is Taras, I'll call you Taras. Uh, but thank you for your question, and uh, that's an excellent question. We are doing exactly that. We are reaching out. Our strategy in terms of outreach and new growth is don't leave a single chip on the table. Leave it all out on the court. That was two sport. That was a, a poker and a basketball reference combined. Uh, leave, leave it all on the court. Do not leave a single potential voter or supporter behind, especially when they're out in the streets saying that they are sick and tired of what government is doing to them. What a perfect opportunity, whether we're talking about gun rights protesters or Black Lives Matter protesters or police accountability protesters or lockdown protesters, people that are out on the street saying government is harming me. I don't like it so much that I'm on the street telling you this. What a perfect example to reach them. And in terms of how we do the change the messaging, you don't really have to change messaging. All you have to do is listen. One thing I learned in over 20 years of running my business, which was largely a sales role, I was selling my business and my wares uh, to different companies and to different clients. And what I learned is that the way that you can show people what it is that you have to offer is to listen to them first. Because A, they don't know a thing about you and have no idea what you're on about and they're, they're a little bit suspicious of you to begin with. And B, once they start talking to you and telling you what their issues are, they, start grow, they are creating bonds 
bonds there. They are already associating you with someone who is sympathetic and empathetic and cares about them. And while that's happening, you're hearing what it is they care about so that you can effectively message to them. And that's what we're doing. We listen to what their concerns are. We validate and empathize those concerns. And then once we have shown that we understand what they're going through and that, they, that we care, then we can take them on the journey for how maximized human liberty is the way forward in every single aspect of our lives. That is how we do it. That is how we go from 3.25% uh, in the last election to the 35 plus percent that we'll need to actually win the electoral college. That's how we do it. Go to where they are in their spaces and, use, and from their precepts, listen to what they're saying, empathize with them, and then take them on the journey for how human liberty is the way forward for all of us. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing? Hi, my name is Janine, and I'm from Maple Grove. And um, Maple Grove. Yeah. Woo! Um, I wanted to get your input on um, how you feel about negative income tax and using that as a welfare replacement tool. Um, I am a big fan of Milton Friedman, mm -hmm. who was an old school libertarian. And um, I, I'm just, I just want your opinion on that, um, uh, whether it's, uh, sometimes it's called universal basic income. EBI and, uh, or ne negative yeah. income tax, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So here's the thing. So I think there's the potential short term uh, to use these types of things to streamline the way that the social safety net exists. Because right now we are not running uh, to get rid of the social safety net. We're running to put the ladders back so people can climb out of it because 99% of the people in it don't want to be there. I've gone to housing projects and talked to folks who own nothing and yet they have these little, they call them side hustles, but they're businesses. And because they can't afford the tens of thousands of dollars in licensing fees and zoning fees and everything else to do it legally, they just do it on the side and it's never, it's enough to put some money in their pocket, but not enough to actually grow a business. They're literally not allowed to market. And I can tell you from 20 years in business, marketing is where it's at. They can't do it because if they do, the police show up with civil asset forfeiture and take everything from them. They don't want to be there. So we put the ladders back and they climb out of it. In the meantime, these are types of things that, you know, negative income tax, UBI, potentially are ways to streamline the social safety net so that instead of means testing, we're just providing a, a basic level of relief. Here's where the problem comes in. It was Janine, right? Here's where the problem comes in, Janine. When you create a system whereby the government is simply handing a check to every single American in this country, two things happen. Number one, you massively increase the money supply every time you're doing that, which as we know, thanks to the Federal Reserve, which we plan to end, by the way, I know how to, I, I, I know how to get applause. Um, the, once we do that, uh, once we give that power and we uh, increase the monetary supply, that causes the cost of living to go up, which means that over time, let's say $1,000 a month has to become $1,200 a month, has to become $1,500, has to become $2,000, and so on and so forth, until eventually, far enough down the road, we have a snowball effect where it gets really, really bad, where suddenly the money is truly, truly worthless. No one even wants it. Here's the other thing that happens. When you give government, when you give politicians the ability to campaign on one single issue, how much of a check they're gonna give you, that's all they're going to talk about. You're going to have me sitting here saying, we need to maximize human uh, freedom and liberty and give the power back to people. And you're gonna have two other people saying, I'm gonna give you $5,000 a month. And then you're gonna have another politician going, that guy, that guy doesn't care about you. I'm gonna give you $10,000 a month. And when you, when you create that, you are creating the ultimate federal trough where they can just hand, they literally buy people's votes directly through that. So those are my concerns with those types of plans long term. The issue that we are facing, why so many people need it in the first place, over and above the, those regulatory burdens that make it so hard for people to move up the economic ladder, to move out of poverty, is also the fact that the federal government controls our currency which means that uh, since the uh, Federal Reserve was created in 1913, your money has lost 98% of, of its value. Imagine if your money was worth 50 times what it's worth right now. That is how much they have robbed you over the last 107 years. So in our mind, the long-term answer, Janine, is to take the power 
of currency completely out of the government to begin with and put it in the hands of the free market. Because now, instead of your currency being issued by a monopoly that has a vested interest in that money losing value over time so that the debts they run up lose value over time, instead, your currency is provided by competing providers that have a vested interest in your currency gaining money over time because... If it doesn't, or if it doesn't gain as much as one of their competitors, they'll lose your business to the competitor. So the free market is the answer here. Short term, there may be a role for negative income tax or UBI, but I would be very careful with how to use it because of the potential for what it could do long term. Thank you. Hey, how are you doing? Good. My name's Travis. I'm from Big Lake, the land of the rock sticks and uh, cows, according to Emperor Palpatine. I mean, Governor Waltz. Uh, is that, that's Big Lake? Yeah. Big Lake! <laughs> so, first thing I want to say is just thank you for being actually a morally, you know, person to vote for, you know, when you're sitting there and looking at Trump and, and Biden. But thank you for thing, not being a monster. You're welcome. <laughs> the second thing is, you know, we talk about ending victimless, victimless crimes. Yes. So, that's coming down to physical, financial, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. What about, like, emotional um, crimes that, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to go about? Let's say the the guy that scares the woman, you know, down the alley or her boyfriend that's threatening to kill her but doesn't physically or financially harm her. So, I mean, I mean, you gave some pretty stark examples of where you're you know, a terrorist, a threat of violence or terrorist threat or something like that, I would argue is not a victimless crime because you're literally like threatening to murder someone. It gets a little more murky with someone just being like a bully or something like that. And the short answer is that's really needs to be ter determined by those individual communities. And I'm not saying that as just a sloth off of your answer. I'm saying that because I'm running for federal office and I don't think the federal government should be involved at all. In my personal opinion, in my community, how I would want it to look is that the, the line, and this is where it's a little bit arbitrary, would be deciding is did the person who was hearing, who was hearing this have a reason, a legitimate reason to think that they should fear, that they should be afraid, or were they just being bothered or hurt? Because bothered or hurt, you know, if you, start, if you start calling it a crime to bother or hurt people, you go in a direction you really don't want to go in. If the, but you have to have the line of like, does this person really believe, uh, that would, would they have a reasonable reason to believe that, that the harm was actually being caused? And it, and it is, there's a gray area there, unfortunately. But uh, I would tend to err on the side of if someone, if there's any question whether or not the person had a reason to believe that their life or their, their, you know, their, their livelihood or whatever was in danger, erring on the side of, of freedom of speech and expression. Uh, but, but again, I, I believe that individual communities should be able to make that choice. That's what was intended with the framework of our country. It's instead of having this you know, top-down, uh, uh, you know, across-the-board standard answer, a one-size-fits-all answer, allowing individual communities to make those kinds of tough, on-the-fringes types of decisions. Thank you. So folks, that is the end of our Q&A, so I'm gonna start mingling, uh, and uh, Kate's gonna come up here and talk with you. Uh, but I just wanted to thank you so much. Give yourselves a round of applause for coming out. And keep it going. And we is are going- is Spike incredible? Let's go win this thing. <laughs> Spike is amazing. Give it, keep it going, keep it going for him. All right, thank you so much, Minnesota. So. As you know, it takes a lot of effort, which usually means lots of money, to get these things going, right? And we are traveling all across the country, Spike and Joe both simultaneously traveling all around the country, and we need your help. So I'm going to give you some simple instructions. There are some beautiful people that have QR codes, and they're going to have they're going to wave them up in the air right now. They're all around you, behind you, in front of you. Now you can. You can scan that QR code and you can go ahead and donate to the campaign. Please, please, please fill our bus tank. Like, we need gas money, okay? We're hurting people. So, you know what kind of money we're up against, right? Y'all know. So we need your help. This is a campaign for the people. So please, if you can, go see these beautiful people. If you have cash, you're gonna see Kathleen. She's got the Magic Joe jar right there. And if you have $50 in cash or less, you can just go drop it in the bucket and say hi. If you have $50 or more, please go to the PPE tables. We have forms that we do need you to fill out. I do have to say that, sorry. Uh, FEC regulations. But here's my challenge. So tonight, we're here in the beautiful state of Minnesota. Tomorrow, we're in Wisconsin. I wanna see 
who's going to put out. And I'm going to be comparing. And I'm going to be putting it on on who wins the little head-to-head -head competition. So open up your wallets. Let us help them change hearts, minds, and get those votes. Thank you so much, Minnesota, for coming out. Now I'm asking you to put out. You can also go to joe20.com slash give. Everyone's got a smartphone, so if you want to stay safe and socially distant, that's how you can also donate. Thank you so much. We'll taking a selfie line uh, just over here. Uh, and I'm also making a call for some volunteers to help me tear down this lovely setup we had for you this evening. Thank you guys for coming out so much. We appreciate it. I'm Jacob LaBelle. Uh, I like Spike because I've known him for a couple of years. Watch his show. He uh, loves liberty. He will discuss anything with you at any time, politely, pleasantly. Uh, just He's all around just a great guy. Uh, very intelligent and very principled. Is there really another option? I mean, to vote for the lesser of evil when really I can, I can actually go vote for someone uh, some people that are just excellent human beings. I don't know. I, I think, you know, Is that empowering for myself. I'm just such an idealistic person that I have to I have to vote for the best option, not the least worst option. And the best option is Spike Cohen and Joe Jorgensen. Money for the Joe Jar. Where's Mirrors? I know. Go ahead, Steel.